chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Romans the fourth chapter. Romans chapter 4. That's where we're going to be in just two seconds. Matthew's not back here to switch my thing. Let's do right there. Romans chapter 4 is where we're going to be in just a second. Appreciate John Polk teaching class for me last Wednesday night. Last Sunday, we, we finished up chapter 3, but didn't quite get to some of the applications of chapter 3, so that's what we're going to actually cover as we begin class right now. And before we jump into any of those, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give to us, and we thank you for our time of study this morning. We thank you for the book of Romans and all of the great rich applications we can draw from it to our lives to better serve you, to be humbled in your holy presence. Pray that you'd be with our shepherds as they watch over us, be with their families, be with us in our work. Pray you'd open doors of opportunity that we might evangelize the world around us and bring them the gospel of your good son. We love you, Lord, and pray you'll be exalted in all that we do. Be with the classes in the back as well. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3. I, th I think we need to have a good understanding of these passages. And so... Right there at the very end of chapter 3, I wanted to make sure, there was one phrase I wanted to make sure we didn't, we didn't misunderstand. Verse 25, this is Romans three twenty-five. whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in blood to demonstrate his righteousness because of the passing over of the sins that were previously committed through the forbearance of God. I wanted to take just a second and, and make sure we covered that passing over of the sins. I had a couple people ask me about that after class the other day. That does not mean that God winked at sin like it wasn't a big deal, left it alone. It wasn't, that's not the idea. The idea is God temporarily allowed them to be engaged in sin, but only because he was going to take care of it through Jesus Christ. Okay? So there, there's kind of an Acts 17, 30, and 31 thing going on here. Okay, so that doesn't mean that, oh, well, God trivialized sin. Sin's not that big of a deal. No, 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 no. It was never like that. Sin's always a big deal to God. Romans 1, 2, and 3 teaches us that. Sin always violates His holy will. Sin always brings serious consequences. Sin always brings guilt before God. But in this moment, what he's talking about is... God was waiting to deal with it through Jesus Christ. Okay? If you have any more questions about that, uh, Larry? Hebrews 9.15. Yeah, Hebrews 9.15 absolutely clarifies that point. Yeah. All right. Okay. So some of the applications from chapters 1, 2, and 3, they're already on the board here. I, I think we need to give serious thought to these. We're not going to spend a lot of time on any one of them because we've got to get about halfway through chapter 4 today in class. But number one, just like the Jews, we've been given a great privilege. Remember that. That's how he starts chapter 3. Well, what's the benefit of being a Jew? And he's like, uh, everything. You, you had the oracles entrusted to you, the oracles of God, the actual words of God entrusted to you. Folks, that is a privilege just like we have today as New Testament Christians. God has entrusted us with his actual words. That is, an, that is an esteemed privilege, and we need to take it very seriously. Number two, I think through that whole section there, verses 1 through 8, we, we see this point demonstrated. God is faithful even when we are not. Now, please understand, let me qualify that. That doesn't mean God is going to be faithful to you even though you reject Him and you go your wayward self and you become a wretched sinner again. That's not my point. My point really is that God remains faithful even when we're struggling. And even when we do go wayward, God is still faithful in that He'll take us back. Right? Everybody with me on that point? God's faithful. God is faithful even when we are not. Number three, probably the, one of the harder ones to accept, and yet it is nonetheless true. Number three, God is just in condemning every person to hell. And make sure you get it with no distinctions, with no differences. Buddy, that's a hard pill to swallow. And yet, that is, 
That is what the book teaches. God is right to send every person to hell. And so, number four, all humanity is desperately in need. Well, if God is just in sending every single person to hell, that means me too. And so I, I, I'm in desperate need. All have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. I'm part of that all. I have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. I've chosen sin over God. And so God, number five, God offers Jesus to pay for sins. That is humbling indeed. And that's what chapter 3, verses 24 and 25 teach. And only through Jesus can sins be paid. He is the propitiation. Number six, only through Jesus then will any person be justified before God. All right, we need to give that some consideration. And those are, there are probably many other applications we could take from the text, but those are the ones that I wanted to share that jumped out to me. Is there any that jump out to you? We're not going to spend a lot of time discussing this, but if you have one that just really is on the edge of your teeth, then now's your chance. All right, now your chance is over. So chapter 4. Uh, did anybody have any questions on chapter 3? It is kind of hard to jump in after a week, but... All right, chapter 4 of Romans. In class this morning, the plan is we're going to cover the first uh, about 12 verses, hopefully, because this chapter is going to break up into two classes. So chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, let's begin by reading the text. And we're going to read down through, let's just break this up so it's not as lengthy a reading, through verse 8. Romans 4 verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something of which to boast, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. We'll stop there. Question number one. Question number one. How was Abraham justified before God? By his faith. By his faith. I want us to think that this answer may not immediately <coughs> jump out to you. What is significant about him bringing up Abraham here? Think about it like this. Is Abraham before the law of Moses or after the law of Moses? Before. Now, guys, remember, the feather in the cap of the Jew is the law of Moses. But now he's going to demonstrate how... Now he's going to demonstrate... It was the right way. Now he's going to demonstrate how Abraham, the patriarch of Israel, Abraham who predates the law of Moses, was justified before God. Yeah, this is a big deal. The reason he brings up Abraham here is to add weight to his overall argument that you could be justified before God apart from the law of Moses. Oh, well, that's what he's going to talk about. Question number two. Define faith as Paul is using it in chapter 4 and verse 5. His faith is counted for righteousness. What, what's a good way we could... What, what's a good word we could put in here as a synonym? His faith is counted as righteousness. Yeah, believes in. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Say it again. Justification. Yeah, justification. Obedience. 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 I'm going to say this, though. Stay with me. We've got to be careful with the word obedience here because, because it can very easily fall into the mindset the Jews had. I've done this. I've done that. I've done this. I've done that. So, therefore, I am justified before God. So, we've got to be careful with that. But the idea is certainly that 
implies obedience to God. That's what we, all, we argue that all the time, don't we? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, John 14. So we get that point, okay? So make, but make sure you get that point. Uh, we've made the point several times. We can't think about baptism as a check the box, now God has to justify me. Because that's, that's not what baptism is. Baptism is an act of faith in God and His ability to save. Uh, Curtis and then Dennis. Curtis. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like that. I like what Curtis said. He's just done what God told him to do. It, it wasn't a meritorious thing. Abraham, he, he, you know, I get, to, I get to be called justified now in God's sight because I did. No, no, no. He just did what God told him to do. It met the condition. Remember us talking about the condition in chapter 3? It met the condition. Doesn't mean he earned it. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get into the text. Dennis? Yeah, that's a good, good point. Good point. Faith implies acting. I can't see an apple at 200 yards, so that's cool. Um, but yeah, I, absolutely, faith implies a response. Okay, we get that. All right, question number three. Uh, and Curtis hinted at this a little bit, but what does Paul mean when he says, apart from works, verse 6? Apart from works. What, what sort of works is he talking about in the text? Law. The law, the law, the law, the law. Remember, guys, we're, we're thinking through this. In, in so many ways, we're thinking through this from the Jewish standpoint of, but God, I kept the law. Well, which law would he be talking about? The law of Moses. I was circumcised on the eighth day as a boy, and I made sacrifice, and I've kept offerings, and I've done, and I've done, and I've done, and I've done. But no amount of I've done it, that's not a thing I know, but no amount, uh, no amount of I've done it is going to justify you before God. And that's where the Jews had missed the point. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment as well. All right, well, question number four, uh, question 4A, 4B, and 4C, um, we'll get to in just a minute if we get time. So, so let's work through this text. Verse 1, what then, what then? We may have noticed that phrase, Paul is a brilliant uh, speaker and a brilliant communicator, that's not discounting his inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit used the individual person's abilities. That's why you see Matthew write in a different style than you see Luke write, because God, the Holy Spirit, used their abilities to communicate the information. So he says, what then? That phrase has been used a bunch already. It's going to continue to be used a bunch, because what he's doing is challenging them, challenging his reader, to think through the logical rationale behind his argumentation. So what then... What shall we say about Abraham? Our forefather, according to the flesh, has found. Uh, to be honest, that is an incredibly difficult verse to translate. It is all about word placement. We, we recognize the words in the Greek are not structured the same way the English translation uses it. In fact, uh, memory serves me correct, uh, Spanish is this way. Oftentimes, the, the words are disordered. You ever had that interaction with Spanish? The words are out of order compared to what they would be in English. Greek is that way. In fact, in the Greek, it actually starts with uh, what then has found Abraham, our forefather, uh, according to the flesh. Well, it's, okay, well, well, we recognize the word order needs to be different. And so when it translates into English, this is what you get generally, and this is a pretty good translation. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? Recognize, in most of your, your 
English translations, they prefer forefather, but the New King James and the King James follow the Textus Receptus and they put in father. There's not really much of a difference, but it is a hotly debated word in that verse. The point is still pretty much the same. You think about these Jews who identified with Abraham, he is our father. Remember that in John chapter 8? When they're talking to Jesus, oh, you can say what you want to, Jesus, but Abraham's our father. They took great pride in Abraham being their father. Abraham was hailed as the preeminent man. There are Jewish traditions. You remember Paul saying to, to Timothy to not get caught up into Jewish fables? Remember that? There were Jewish traditions that Abraham never sinned. You believe that? There were Jewish traditions that Abraham never sinned. In fact, that same tradition taught that Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, all three, the forefathers, they never sinned, were never guilty of sin. Okay? There was also traditions that taught Abraham was justified by his works. That God told Abraham to do, Abraham did, and therefore God owed him justification. You recognize Paul's coming after all of those traditions in just a few verses. Now, nowhere is Paul saying, well, Abraham was really just a rotten old scoundrel. No, he respects Abraham. He calls him our forefather. Abraham was a great man, but as great as Abraham was, he was no less a sinner before God and no less in need of justification before God. And the way he got his justification was the same as the way we get our justification. Okay? So what shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? According to the flesh. That, that phrase is used quite a bit. So more than likely, this indicates he's speaking predominantly to a Jewish audience. Because that's what according to the flesh means. According to lineage, according to birthright, according to bloodline, whatever you want to insert there, the idea is the same. But here, here's what's so rich and awesome about this. Abraham is identified as the Jewish father. A few verses, Abraham is going to be identified as the father of all those who believe. Okay? So these people who claim, well, Abraham's our father. Abraham's our father. Abraham's our father. And Paul's going to say, really? Abraham's the father of everybody who's willing to be faithful to God. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we get to be children of Abraham too because Abraham blazed the trail of what it means to be faithful to God. And so he's going to talk about that in just a second. The phrase has found, uh, it really is a fascinating phrase. It comes from the same, the same word family as Noah who found grace in the eyes of God in Genesis 6. It's the same concept. Abraham found something. It doesn't mean that he, he just kind of bumbling and stumbling fell across it. It doesn't mean that he earned it or worked for it. It means that it was something that God granted to him. Noah found grace in the eyes of God, just like Abraham found justification here. Okay, And so that's how he's going to explain it in verse 2. So verse 2, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. I love everything about that verse. Everything about it. Abraham, here's the deal. If he was justified by works, that was the Jewish position of the day. The Jewish position of the day was Abraham was justified by works. And Paul says, okay, folks, let's just entertain that argument for just a minute. Let's say Abraham was justified by his works. Then here's the deal. Abraham has every reason to boast over me. You see what he's saying? If Abraham really did, if, again, big if here, but if Abraham was justified by his works, then he has something to boast about when he's talking to me. But see what he does with that last clause? but not before God. You, you, don't you just love that? I'm sorry, I love it. But that's his point. So if, for the sake of argument, Abraham was justified by his works, which, it, which is, he wasn't, as he's going to explain, he could boast about it before other men, but not before God, because the, the whole premise is flawed, right? Chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Romans clearly taught that all are guilty of sin before God. Does the all include Abraham? Yes. Abraham is not justified by his works. Abraham is a type. Abraham was justified by his faith in God, which is exactly what he ends chapter 3 with. You want to be justified before God? You better have faith in Jesus. Jesus is God. 
Abraham is the preeminent example of how we are justified before a holy God. And it's not on the basis of works, earning it, meriting it. It's on the basis of compliance with the conditions set forth by God. Do what God told you to do. And so Abraham, he couldn't boast about any of this before God. So verse 3, for what does the scripture say? So here, here's, here's the premise. Paul says, all right, here's point one. Oh, you want some scripture to back that up? Let me just bring some scripture in here. He wasn't justified before God. He has nothing to boast about before God on the basis of his works. And here's where God said so. That's what scripture says. So verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What Old Testament passage is he referring to here? Genesis, Genesis 15, 6. Genesis 15, 6. That passage is quoted a lot in the New Testament, a lot in Romans. It was quoted a lot in Jewish circles as well. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Here's what's kind of important about that. The fact that Abraham believed God is the reason God credited to him righteousness. The, the New King James uses the old Calvinist word imputed. That doesn't mean imputed. The credited is a much better translation because the, the terminology is, is much like balancing account, uh, account statements. Okay? He credited this to Abraham because Abraham was faithful. Abraham believed, and because of his belief, he acted and responded to the word and will of God. Because of that, God put it on his account, okay, that he was righteous. Does everybody kind of follow that? That's going to surface again several times in this text. But Abraham was credited as righteous because he believed. Uh, Dennis? Yeah, that's right. He went out 200 yards, put the apple on his head, and the Lord shot through the apple with a bow and arrow. Uh, Phyllis? Yeah, yeah, in some ways. In some ways, yeah. I, I will suggest this, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to come up again in just a minute. Some people look at that statement in Genesis 15, 6, which he quotes here. They look at that as, as the conversion of Abraham. Oh, see? Now we get to be saved just by believing in the Lord. That's not what Genesis 15, 6 is talking about. Now, I say that because there's a lot of reasons for this statement. Genesis 15, 6 is a summary statement of the life of Abraham. It is a snapshot of Abraham's life. What happens in Genesis 12? The promise. What does God tell Abraham in Genesis 12? Say that again. Yeah. No, you're, you're exactly right. That, that's part of the three promises. But what's the first command God gives Abraham in Genesis 12? Go. Go. Get out of Dodge. Get out of Ur of the Chaldeans. That's how he starts. Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, Abraham, get out of your country. Get away from your family. Go to the place I'm telling you. And here's what's going to happen. Here's the promises you're going to have. Folks, that's years before Genesis 15. Years before Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, God renews the covenant with Abraham. This is where we get this great statement. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But Abraham already believed God. Abraham already was doing what God told him to do. This is not about a conversion. It's a snapshot of his life. In chapter 17 of Genesis, this is important stuff to kind of, you know, catalog in your mind. In Genesis 17, you have the circumcision. This is years before the circumcision takes place. You don't think that resonates to a Jewish audience? Abraham was a, believed God and was credited to him as righteousness years before he was circumcised? What? Yeah, that resonates with a Jewish audience. This is years before he offers Isaac. Years. That doesn't take place until Genesis 22, folks. But in Genesis 15, 6, God says to Abraham, your faith is credited as righteousness because Abraham already was acting on his faith, already believed God. Uh, Curtis? Curtis? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that fundamentally, that's the point. Had, had Abraham not left Ur in, in Genesis 12, could he have said in chapter 15, well, Abraham believed God. It was credited to him for righteousness. No, because he never left home like God told him to. And so uh, you got to be careful here, folks. To take the traditional denominational viewpoint of this passage is going to put you in contradiction of James 2, just fundamentally. You show me your faith by your works. The faith is an active, in, uh, active entity. That's how you look at Genesis, or that's how you look at, at Romans 4, and you look at James 2. James 2 especially talks about this. Uh, go ahead, Dennis. That's right. That's right. Your faith proves you believe. This is why Abraham believed God. It was credited to him for righteousness. Okay? Verse 4. Now, the one who works, the wages are not credited as a favor, but as what is due. He borrows an illustration from the work environment. When a person works in a job, they are now owed payment. So an individual gets a job, they work, now this employer is in debt to them, right? That's not how it works with spiritual things, and that's not how it works with God. There's no amount of doing that puts God in your debt. God doesn't owe you anything, and I think that's a, a humbling point from chapter 3, folks, that if you really were paid what you are owed, you and I both are going to hell. If God paid you what you are owed, <laughs> oh, well, God, I want what's due me. Okay, fiery pits of hell. That's what you're due. But God doesn't want to do that. He wants to save. He wants to extend His grace through Jesus Christ. And so through Jesus Christ, we can have propitiation, we can have the payments made through Jesus, and we can be saved. But it is not because we've done something so great. It's because Jesus has done something so great. So verse 4 reminds us of that very fundamental principle. In the workforce, this is the way it is. Verse 5, But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Yes, as Larry pointed out, the concept in verse four is, is the idea of keeping it perfectly. So it's not just well working to the state and getting an earning or God owing you something. It's if you kept the law perfectly, you're owed. Nobody keeps the law perfectly. Chapter three already detailed that. Exactly right. Uh, so verse 5, the one who does not work but believes who, in him who justifies the ungodly. Now, it doesn't mean that, that, well, you just don't do anything. That's not his point. But it is a difference of mentality. So this individual who, who instead of relying on perfectly keeping the work, perfectly keeping the law, instead what this individual is doing is relying wholly on the God who wants to save on him who justifies the ungodly. you got to love that phrase because it's a paradox. The ungodly don't deserve to be justified. And yet God wants to justify the ungodly. God wants to take those who have been against him. That's what ungodly means. That is without God, against God even. He wants to justify those people. But he's not going to do it willy-nilly. He's only going to do it through his son, Jesus Christ. That's who has this faith that's credited as righteousness. The very end of verse 5. His faith is credited as righteousness. That's what we want. The same thing happened to Abraham. Abraham wasn't doing things trying to earn salvation, wasn't trying to merit salvation, wasn't trying to get God, well, you know, God's really in debt to me because I'm Abraham. No. Just like Curtis said. It's so simple, guys. Just like Curtis said. God told Abraham, and Abraham went and did. Isn't that what whole, the whole chapter 11 of uh, the book of Hebrews is about? By faith, Enoch did. By faith, Noah did. By faith, Abraham did. By faith, Abel did. Folks, that's all it is. It's not, I'm, I'm going to get baptized. Now, God, he just already got a check written out to me. He owes me. Signature's at the bottom. The amount's not written in yet, but God owes me because I got baptized. No, no. But I did comply with the conditions. And that's a totally different ballgame, totally different discussion. All right, let's move, move along here. Verse 6. 
So now he's going to shift the discussion just a little bit. So he's illustrated this point with Abraham. Now he's going to illustrate it with David. So verse 6, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the person to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. There are few figures that played so heavily in the Jewish religion as Abraham and David. It doesn't get better than that, folks. Remember how Matthew's gospel begins? This is the beginning of, or the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, because that's the two guys, if you're a Jew, which that's who Matthew was written to, if you're a Jew, that's the two guys we want to talk about the most. Abraham, who never sinned in Jewish religion, and who was faithful and kept covenants with God, interacted with God, and David, the king, the one who would have an eternal kingdom, whose lineage would know no end. David said it this way too. That's Paul's point. Scripture backs this up in the, in the speaking of Abraham and in the speaking of David. So David talks about the blessing or, or the blessedness. It sounds a little bit like the Beatitudes. Blessed is the man... Actually, that's a psalm. I'm quoting Psalm 1. Uh, but, but anyway, but you, you recognize the language. Blessed. Blessed is the idea. And so you could say happy. I hate that phrase because it's kind of a misnomer. B but the idea is this is the contentment of a right relationship with God. This is how this person feels. They feel blessed. They feel content. That's the person who God credits righteousness apart from works. Apart from the works of the law. Separate and apart from the law. God justifies a person on the basis of their faithfulness to Him. So here's the quotation from Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Same phrase, blessed. Blessed. This individual is blessed by God by virtue of their relationship with God. This individual whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. Lawless deeds, same word as ungodly in the previous verse. This individual who has been wayward, has lived a, a contrary to God, is forgiven. Sometimes, you don't hear this much anymore. Maybe it's because I preach and I don't listen as much anymore. But you used to hear a lot that the old law, under the old law, the sins were rolled forward. I don't like that. I don't think it's biblical. David says that he was forgiven. Forgiven. He says the same thing in Psalm 51. Now, don't misunderstand me. Forgiven because of Jesus Christ. Uh, Larry alluded to Hebrews 9 earlier. That's the point. These Old Testament heroes were forgiven on the basis of Jesus Christ. But they were forgiven. They stood forgiven. Here's the individual who's blessed because the lawless deeds have been forgiven. And that next phrase is a parallelism, whose sins have been covered. The idea is not, not that they're hidden, that they're tucked away, and they just kind of throw a blanket over it. No, the idea is they're not brought into the discussion, okay, which is explained in the next verse. The individual whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Don't you see that, folks? It's as if God, maybe this image will help, it's as if God is sitting at his desk, and there are piles of, of sin right here. But because this individual is forgiven, because of this individual's faithfulness to God and propitiation through Jesus Christ, God takes these little sins that's on the side of the desk and just swipes them off. They're not even brought into the discussion now. Why? Because God forgave. Because those sins were covered. Because God's not going to bring them into account. Do you recognize the accounting terminology again? They're not brought into account. The, the New King James in verse 8 uses the word impute again. Okay, if you're, you, you guys know I'm a New King James guy. This is one spot where I don't like the New King James. They, they, they gets it wrong. Influence of Calvinism probably had a lot to do with that. The word's not imputed here. The word is very much like the New American Standard renders it, not taken into account. Okay? This is the basis of propitiation through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ pays the bill, pays the tab, pays. And so that, that doesn't mean we're covered in the righteousness of Christ. That doesn't mean that God puts out a little umbrella and what he sees is Jesus and Jesus' righteousness and not your unrighteousness. No, none of those things. You have been forgiven. The tabs have been emptied. 
And God looks at you, God sees you as a forgiven individual person who is righteous. We could talk a lot about that. I mean, there's been hundreds of years of Calvinism taught about the word imputed. So I'm not going to cover it in 43 seconds. All right? But if you have more questions about that, we can talk about it later. So verse 9. Here, here's the put it together. Verse 9. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? Think about that question. Boy, it's a challenging thought. As, as Paul's rationale through this is building to a crescendo, he's saying, oh, all right, blessedness. That's what we looked at in verse 6, 7, and 8. Blessed, 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 blessed. Paul's question, all right, Jews... Is this status of being blessed by God, blessed before God, is it just for the circumcised? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? Recognize two classes of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. That's who he's talking about. Remember that. Circumcised, that's the Jews. Uncircumcised, that's the Gentiles. That's the basis of his question. Well, are they all circumcised? Yeah, they all can be. Because what he says at verse 9, For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Not the law, not the law, but by faith, Abraham was justified before God. By faith, Abraham was called righteous before God. And by faith, we can experience the same thing. See his point? Boy, that's, that's great stuff. We've got about seven minutes. We're going to try to finish these last few verses here. Verse 10, how then was it credited? So think about that, that where he just left off, where he's going now. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. I hate reading it where you can see the text too because if I'm reading my own text, you don't know when I'm messing up. But when you're looking at the text I'm reading, I can't hide it. Well, that dude cannot read. No, I, I know. All right. All right, number four. I'll ask the question here. Number four. What, what's the basis? And I know this is a big one. What's the basis of Paul's argument regarding Abraham in these three verses? Oh, that's it right there. That's it. God considered him faithful before he was circumcised. Now, doesn't that mean something to you and I? Yeah, it does. All right, the second question there, number four. How is Abraham the father of all those who believe? How is he the father of all those who believe? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great, great point. He blazed the trail, we might say. He blazed the trail of how we're going to be faithful before God. All right, and then the, the third question there on number four. What indicates an ongoing obedience from Abraham to God? This one's really simple, but I'm, I, you need to get it. Okay, this, this one you, you need to get in the context of our discussion. So I'll save that for you till the end. All right. Verse 10. And yeah, I'm going to finish answering that question. Okay. Verse 10, though. So this is the question. He was credited as righteous. That's the whole thing David's talking about in the Old Testament quotations from Psalm 32. That's what he's argued with Abraham before those verses. So how did it happen? Was it while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? And here's his, here's his argument. It wasn't while he was circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Why does he say that? Because of what we've already observed. Genesis 15, 6, where this quotation comes from, is before Genesis 17, where Abraham was circumcised. In fact, some estimations put that between 14 and 30 years earlier. Genesis 15, 15 to 30 years earlier than Genesis 17. Okay? That means he went 15 to 30 years being called righteous before God when he was not circumcised. But he was a man faithful to God. So, verse 11. He received the sign of circumcision. Genesis 17. He received the sign of circumcision. A seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. Here, here's the idea. 
that demonstrated, of his, that was a demonstration of his faith. He proved how faithful he was to God because he went and got circumcised, though he'd already been following God for decades at this point. Decades of faithfulness to God. The circumcision was a sign of how faithful to God he was. And that's kind of the idea. It was a sign. And so, verse 11, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. So, so here's, here's the discussion then. He's the father of all those who simply believe. Now, don't take that beyond the context of our discussion already. I don't mean a mental ascent. Well, I just believe God exists. That's not what Abraham did. Abraham was far more than just believing God existed, wasn't he? I'm going to tell you right now, you don't just go out and get circumcised because you believe God exists. <laughs> you do that because you know God exists and you believe the words he said. Remember that? That's a big thing in Hebrews 11. Folks, he went out on the word of God, not knowing where he was going, wandering about as a tent liver, but believing in a city made by the hands of God. He'd never seen that, but he believed. And because of his belief, he did. Oh, man, I, we could talk about that for all month, like our theme this year is all month on Abraham. Russ is going to talk about Abraham tonight. All right, so, so this is the individual. This is Abraham. Halfway through verse 11, so he might be the father of all those who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. This, in, in some sense, Abraham is a trailblazer. He showed it to everybody that you can be faithful to God and called righteous before God without the law of Moses. In some Jewish circles, Abraham was the preeminent convert because in Jewish minds... He kept the law perfectly, even though there was no law. Paul's derailing that whole, that whole superstition right here. They also believe that he was the preeminent convert because in their minds he was a pagan while in Ur of the Chaldeans. Last Sunday morning I talked about that. He did. It, it, Joshua even says in Joshua 24, he worshipped the other gods across the river. But he came to believe in the true and living God. Well, that's the Jewish mind is like, well, he's the best convert we've ever had. And then all of the Jewish faith came from him. But here, here's what God says about Abraham. He's the father of those who believe without being circumcised. That he is the individual that showed us these things, that righteousness could be credited to us by the same manner through faith in God. Verse 12, the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. Abraham is the father. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had father Abraham. Um, I cannot. I, I sang that three weeks. I sang that for three weeks. But, but here's the deal, folks. Abraham is the father of the Jews. Those circumcised but can be justified in God's sight by faith. Abraham is the father of the uncircumcised, those who never had the law, never knew the law, never kept the law. Why? Because we can be justified by faith in God, just like Abraham was. Now, here, here's what I want you to see. This is important. You're talking to somebody, especially with a denominational inkling, and they're saying, well, we're justified by faith, belief only, mental assent, for the record, um, most of your denominational scholars don't believe that. It's just your run-of-the-mill denominational friends that believe that. But the scholars, their academic scholars that write on these subjects don't believe that. Now, they wouldn't say you're, you know, need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. They wouldn't say that. But they certainly wouldn't say mental ascent all we're talking about. What they would say is faithfulness, allegiance, some of the same things I say. <laughs> You want to be justified before God? You better swear your allegiance to King Jesus. I've said that before, haven't I? Well, that's how we're justified. But I want you to see this, because if you're having a discussion with somebody, this is a simple thing to, to recognize. Verse 12, those who, very last phrase there, those who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. You, you recognize the question on your worksheet We'll finish this very quickly. The question on your worksheet, 
What demonstrates Abraham's obedience? That phrase, the steps of faith. That is an ongoing thing. That's a progressional thing. We walk in steps of faith. That shows ongoing obedience. It doesn't say a, a step. It doesn't, say the, it, do, it doesn't omit all of that and just say the faith of our father Abraham. It says the steps of the faith. Steps is ongoing. That's a good little phrase to underline in that text. If you're an underliner, that's a good phrase to do it. Because that right there is what we've been talking about this whole time. You want to be justified before God, you're going to be faithful to God. What's faithful mean? Faithful means believing and, and responsive to Him. That means ongoing allegiance to King Jesus. Well, that's how we're justified before God. That's how we're justified by faith before God. Okay? All right. Uh, well, that was the second bell, wasn't it? All right, I appreciate your attention. Uh, I think John Polk is teaching Wednesday night, but we may also continue this, this text Wednesday night. My plans have been kind of changed, so I'm not sure yet. JP and I'll talk, and I'll let you know. But I appreciate your attention.